All right, it is seven o'clock, so we want to go ahead and get started uh, so that we make sure we have time for people's questions. Um, if you are here, you are interested in University of North Texas's uh, programs uh, for school librarianship and children's and young adult librarianship. So I am here. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sarah Evans. I am here with my wonderful co-host, Dr. Trisha Kwan, and we are going to tell you about these things. I'm going to um, start with um, the children's and young adult librarianship part. So. Uh, because I am the advisor for uh, children's and young adult librarianship program. Uh, we are changing the name. Um, it used to just be called youth librarianship and sometimes that confused people because they didn't think we did things with kids, but no, we um, train you to cover the uh, gamut of ages from birth to even to um, thinking about um, people in their young adult age. So, um why a career in children's and young adult librarianship well first of all as i said it's a people-centered program the emphasis of their program is how you interact with people how you make connections with them um, i say connections with context um, yes we are information providers um, but we are also relationship builders um, because that is how you get people to um, trust your information. That's how you get people to grow and learn. Um, so that is definitely a focus that we have in our classes and programs is how do you create connections with context for um, the kids that you interact with and their families as well? Um, because a children's and young adult librarianship career is generally in the public library setting. Um, also, uh, a big focus is being based in the community. I talked about creating relationships. Um, nobody's going to come into the public library if they don't really know what's there or they're concerned or nervous or afraid. So um, it's really important that our libraries serve the communities in which they are based. And so a big part of what we uh, talk about in our program and encourage you and prepare you for is working directly with communities and how to do that best. Um, and lastly, um, equity driven. Um, that is a um, concern of everybody in the world, in the US especially, it should be. And it's definitely a focus for myself and for um, the faculty who are in these areas working with youth and families um, because our job is to be good community stewards and to provide access for information. And we need to think about how to make that equitable access. So what does a children's librarian do? Um, kind of what you'd expect. Um, these here are the um, competencies that are put forth by um, the Association for Library services uh, for children, which is a primary professional organization that children's librarians are associated with. Um, and really, you establish relationships, like I mentioned, you plan library services for children zero to 11 and their families. So, um, you know, obviously, especially when they're little, you, the babies can't come toddle in for story time. So you need to work with the families and that can be a huge strength and benefit. Um, there's research around that um, to work with the families and especially helping them as they're um, figuring out how to help their children develop literacy skills. Um, I emphasized library services because it is not just about handing out books or doing story time. Um, and similar with organizing programs and materials, um, there are all kinds of programs that you can either put on yourself or have other people in the community, which is even better, um, connect with them. And the main focus is getting stuff that will meet the needs currently of your community. So you collaborate with organizations, we prepare you for that, um, advocate for the needs of children and families in the library and in the community because your focus is on kids. And so you are able to understand the research and understand what's happening with kids and advocate for them. 
And then as a librarian, your job is never, your learning job is never done. You must continue to learn. Um, and we set you up for that to help you be a lifelong learner um, so that you can continue to be um, a great librarian. Uh, now for teen librarianship, it's pretty much the same. Um, they, here is a snapshot of the competencies from the Young Adult Library Services Association, which is the um, primary professional organization for library staff who work with uh, teenagers, something that I'm involved in a lot. Um, and you know, you do the same kind of things. You're probably uh, interacting, obviously, more directly with the youth. Um, but what's really nice about um, being a public librarian is you do get to know people um, throughout their lives in your community. So um, you know, someone might start by coming to your baby story times with mom or grandma or another caretaker, and then you see them through toddler preschool. You know, and then they're in middle school and you're helping them with a project. So um, there is a lot of fun potential across age ranges. Um, again, you're collaborating, you're organizing, being an advocate. This is really important. A lot of teen library staff and librarians will tell you this um, because um, teenagers and their actions can sometimes startle adults. And it's uh, our role to advocate for, for teenagers and again, continue learning. So if you want to be an official librarian um, in a public library, then you do need to have a master's degree in library or information science. Um, and then that gives you every state sort of certifies you with that. If you've taken your classes at an accredited school or college, which we are. Um, for this particular concentration, uh the three you have three required courses you have to earn grades of b or higher um there are elective courses there are six prescribed electives that you choose from then um a list that you choose for your other um three general electives and then um you have the practicum Practica means you spend 120 hours in a library doing youth services related tasks you can get a waiver for this um, but only, and I'm pretty strict about this, you need to have been working in a library, public library for at least six months, and you need to show me um, that you have been doing services actually with kids and our teens. And then uh, uh, Trisha will talk more about the portfolio um, experience, which is your graduation capstone eventually. Uh, so starting this fall, we have um, new requirements uh, for the courses that you take for this concentration, because I really wanted to make sure that we were preparing our students for the skills that they need in the future. So um, all masters uh, information and library science do the uh, first three there. Um, but then the, the prescribed electives, you, you choose six. So you take a class um, focused on marketing and customer relationships, because that's sometimes people are nervous, so they're not sure how to establish relationships. Um, you have to take either public libraries or academic libraries. I know some of you out there maybe want to be the person working with children's and young adult literature in a university library. So you could take that information resources development, literature for youth, so it's like collection development and stuff. Um, the history and culture of youth information services is our, our primary course. It's offered every spring that really focuses in on what we do with our communities and the kids. Uh, and then we do have some other seminars. Now, if you already have a master's degree um, or you want a different focus for your master's, but you'd still like some sort of um, built in knowledge about um, serving kids, families and youth in the uh, public library space, we do have a graduate academic certificate, um, which you can uh, overlap with if you're doing the school librarianship or something else, um, you do need to take 5445. Um, you need to take either youth literature for public librarians, or we do have um, in the summers, we offer a course that's about diverse literature. Um, and then you have to take either marketing um, and customer relations or the information resources and services for diverse communities. And then you get to choose another elective and it's just four courses long. And so those are the options.
Um, so again, uh, why choose us? Um, our program is very much focused on um, being in tune with what librarians are wrestling with. Um, it's like all our faculty are involved in professional organizations and research with public libraries. I'm per, I have um, one small and one big grant that I'm um, working on where I actually spend time in public libraries with librarians and help them. So um, we are very focused on that. Um, we have a multiple literacies lab, which is what this is coming to you under. Um, all of us are involved in research, looking at literacies in different ways, whether it's digital literacy or engineering type literacies, um, all kinds of ways. And then we are accredited and recognized as a great choice for your um, library and information science studies. Uh, so at the slide at the end, we'll also have my contact information. And you can find me on Twitter at Sarah Amber. We are over in Discovery Park, if you're ever in Denton, uh, which is a little bit far away from campus, uh, like about 10 minutes or something. Um, we're in our own kind of special space, but yeah. So that is it for tonight. Let me end my show so that Trisha can take over. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you tonight. It'll just take me a second to get going. Glad you could join us on a Wednesday night. If you're on spring break, good for you. If not, maybe you're on spring break next week, which is also good. So I can't see my, my slide. Can you see it, Sarah? You're muted. I cannot see it. Oh, well, this is interesting. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to try again. Okay. Right. Well, I'm going to maybe. Huh. I know it says you can, you have permission to share. Yeah, it's just a black screen. Oh, now I don't even see uh, you. It's still here. Okay. Hold you can on. always um, email me. <laughs> uh, thing right. and I can run it for so, you. Yeah, well, thank you. Let me see. I'm going to try again. That is so weird. I've never had to do that. It's, uh, yeah, it's giving me a black screen. I wonder if it's doing, hmm, let me check something real quick. Sorry, y'all. Didn't expect this to happen. While Trisha works on that, you can throw questions in the chat. Um, uh, in general, um, tell us what you're reading. Tell us. Okay, Sarah, I'm going to email this to you. Just so, okay. that, so earlier today, I was using two screens. Oh. Um, and so I don't know if it did something to my computer, <laughs> but I'm not using two screens now. <laughs> but it's saying, uh, yeah, uh, it's putting me on a black screen. It's very weird. OK, let's see. I've got to find it. OK. All right. Well, it says that the attachment is loading, so it's just going to be slow. Apparently, um, some kind of internet service went down today too. Amazon Web oh, Services, I, I think. Oh. Okay, I think it's sent now. We will see. That and is a big we'll, deal if that goes down. We'll try. Because <laughs> a lot of the, I mean, a lot of businesses have their backend cloud servers in that. Mm, so you'd be surprised. Yeah, I know when it's gone down before, it's caused chaos. So. Now, are you still sharing your screen, Sarah? You're no, not. I'm not. Right? Okay, because it just says one participant can share at a time. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, I think it thinks that I'm sharing, but I don't think I am. So we'll see yes. if you're able right. to. Sorry, everyone. Sorry. I will download it and then um, and then open it up and you'll just have to say next slide, next slide. Okay, that's fine. I can do uh, that. Kind of traditional. Oh, oh there's a Robin question. Robin Harris has a question. 
about admissions is the admissions process do you consider a holistic approach i've been out of school 22 years and the 20 something i was in not who i am anymore <laughs> and your gpa is not who you are today either we get that <laughs> that happens that happens a lot do you know sarah is there a gpa requirement uh, I, I think there is a minimum, but it's not to, um, um, I, I'd have to look it up. Sorry, let me. I'm, I'm trying to remember myself. Is it a 2.5 maybe? Yeah, it's not, it's not really strict. Um, and we do look at things um, quite holistically. So it is more. Oh, there okay. it is. Okay, there well, it's working for you. Yay. <laughs> All right. So I am Trisha Kwan, and I work in the school library program here at the University of North Texas and in the information science department. So Sarah and I are colleagues. Um, I love working here at UNT. I have also worked at Texas Woman's University. So has Sarah. <laughs> and I have worked at Sam Houston State University. So I can tell you, having worked at other school library programs in the state, that UNT's is the best, I think, for several reasons. Number one, Sam Houston charges a little bit more, which is just crazy. It's not a lot, but it's a little. Uh, Texas Women's University is a great program, but we have a lot more classes that are geared for school librarians in our master's degree program. I'm not exactly sure how many, but I know we do nine. I'm not sure how many they do. But, but we have nine of the classes in the master's degree program that are completely geared for just school librarians. So that's really nice and really helpful. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what happens in the school library program. Now, as well as my my share screen not working. I have to warn you, my dog is in the house somewhere and she's being awful tonight. <laughs> so she's just on a tear and barking like crazy. So, okay. so I apologize for her if she interrupts, but you know. <laughs> so why should you become a school librarian? Now, all these pictures, by the way, are from campus. You might not ever go to campus because the, the program is completely online, but there are, it is beautiful. If you ever do get a chance, you should go because it's gorgeous. But let's talk for a minute about why you should become a school librarian. Go ahead, Sarah. Go to the next slide. Uh, number one, you hear a lot about influencers these days, you know, on TikTok and YouTube. I mean, everyone wants to be TikTok famous, <laughs> YouTube famous. Not everyone, but you know you hear that because they are influencers. In fact, one time I had a little invention and I was going to hire an influencer on YouTube to talk about my invention and they charge about $50,000 for 10 minutes. It's crazy. But in the library, you get to be an influencer. You don't make that kind of money, <laughs> but you get to be an influencer in your community and in your school and you can make an impact on every single person in the school, whether it be a teacher or a student or the administrator administration and it's a positive impact it is it is such a wonderful privilege to get to be in a position where you really can make a huge positive impact i won't i won't belabor this too much but you know just encouraging kids to become readers is number one really difficult because there's so many choices these days but it's so important because if you think about it the better, the more you read, the better you read. The better you read, the easier reading is. The easier schoolwork becomes of every kind. You tend, better readers who read more become more educated. Lots of research on that. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to have a job that you actually like. <laughs> the more money you tend to make. I mean, it's this domino effect. It all starts though with just wanting to be a reader, just being excited about books. The great news is there's never been more great books out there than right now. Thousands of books published every year. So many great books, so little time. <laughs> so it's not hard. It's just someone has to be there that cares, right? So, so that's something that's important about being a school librarian. Go ahead, Sarah. Next. 
So let's talk about some other ways that we make a difference. Isn't that a beautiful flower? Go ahead, Sarah, next slide. So one of the things that we really focus on is providing a welcoming environment. We are in the customer service industry in the school library. The customers are the students and the teachers. And what we want to do is make the library a place that they want to be. It's, you know, we are taking care of the library, but it's not really ours, it's theirs, right? So this can be so much fun <laughs> because you can think, okay, this student population, what would they like. I've seen some pretty cool things. I, I get to work with practicum students. So one uh, high school librarian had put in some, some exercise bikes by the windows in her library and they had like the little book stand so that kids could, you know, ride the exercise bike and get some exercise while they were reading. I mean, the sky is the limit. Whatever you can think of, it is so much fun. So providing that environment, though, that place that they just want to come, even if they're just coming to play video games and hang out you're going to have so many cool books all around they're going to check out the books too so so you know this is part of what we do and that's something that we talk about in our in our coursework go ahead sarah next slide we also of course encourage enthusiasm for books whatever we can do to get students to want to read that is what we do and so any i used to come up with just crazy Crazy ideas. <laughs> my very first job, I said to my principal, can I turn the library into a campground? And she was like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, but you know, the kids will love it. I wanted them to be excited. I mean, we had tents, boats, tubes in the library. They loved it. They wanted to be there all the time. And I was drawing them in with the tubes and the boats and, you know, the tents. But really, it was all about the books. <laughs> it was all about getting the books in their hands. So when you get people excited about coming to your library, they're going to want to keep coming back. Go ahead, Sarah. Next. Oh, we also collaborate a lot. We will talk about that uh, quite a bit because it really is important to work with teachers, to work with parents, to work with everyone we can, all of the stakeholders that we can work with. That is the goal. We, we want to get out there. We want to be a leader and the best leaders lead by example. They get in there in the trenches, right? I mean, we've all seen good leaders and we've seen bad leaders. You know, the bad leaders are the ones that stand up on a pedestal and tell everyone what to do while they just sit there not doing anything. The good leaders are the ones who are pulling every, they're in the head, right? They're leading by example. They're doing all the dirty work too. So collaborating, that's a big part of the job as a school librarian. And, and it is, it is um, fun and it makes, it makes such a huge difference for the school and the community. Go ahead, Sarah, we'll go to the next one. All right, we also do talk about technology a lot. Technology, of course, is not going anywhere. It's here <laughs> and, and it's fantastic. Back in the day, oh my gosh, like 15 years ago, I used to teach classes on how to use Excel for school librarians and people would cry. <laughs> do you, anyone remember back when Excel was new? It's like, don't cry, <laughs> you can do this. <laughs> and we're using things a lot more advanced than Excel now. Now, but it's all designed to make life easier, right? And sometimes what happens, you know, if you're a teacher, how crazy it is and how many expectations there are for your time. You don't always have time to learn all these new technologies or the money or whatever. But in the library, you're going to have that time set aside to figure out, okay, what, what's going on with these technologies and how can I use them with students and how can I use them with teachers? That is definitely going to be part of the job moving forward. So we use a lot of technology and encourage you to learn some new things. Sometimes people will say to me, oh, I know this other program, though. Can I use it instead? And I say, no, because <laughs> I want you to try something new. It's going to be fun. You're going to love it. And they do <laughs> after they try it. So go ahead, Sarah. Next slide. 
we definitely stay on top of cutting edge trends. So one of the cutting edge trends lately has been maker spaces. I love to talk about maker spaces. I think we all talk about it in our class to some extent because maker the maker movement is really changing education. And a lot of times maker spaces are in the library now. In fact, I teach a whole course just on maker spaces. It is so much fun. Other cutting edge trends that I'm seeing are things like virtual reality and how can we use it in the classroom? How can we use it in the library? How can we use it with our kids? Not just virtual reality, but augmented reality. So we're always thinking about, hmm, what can we do cutting edge? What can we do new and different and exciting? Just to there again, get everyone excited about coming to the library. Go ahead, Sarah. It really is the best job in the world. I mean, if you want to work at the best job in the world, this is what you want to do. <laughs> Let me tell you, it is fun. Um, teaching is fabulous. You, you still get to teach as a librarian, but you don't have quite the pressure on you, let's say, that teachers have. Those of you who are teachers, you know what I'm talking about, the, the time commitments. There's a lot of work to do in the library, but it's not due today. <laughs> it's not due tomorrow. You're not going to be held accountable for someone's score on the STAR test. You don't have papers to grade. It's a very different kind of job, but still, it kind of combines the best parts of teaching without <laughs> and and you know and I don't know how else to put it other than that teach there's nothing better than teaching too it's a wonderful job but but you know how how it is <laughs> let's just say that but being a school librarian really is the best job in the world it is so much fun never a dull moment there are just a lot of hats to wear and the sky is the limit for what you can do as a school librarian next slide so now that we're all pumped up we'll talk about <laughs> the actual requirements. There are two ways to become a school librarian. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, first off, if you already have a master's degree, you can just take the school li library certification courses. And there are nine of those courses that are required in our program. So that's 27 credits, nine courses. But if you don't have a master's degree, you must have one in order to be certified in the state of Texas. If you're joining us from somewhere outside of Texas, you'll have to check with your state about the requirements because every state has different requirements. We focus on Texas requirements, although we welcome students from other states as well. So a Master of Library Science degree is the other option for, uh, for, for being a school librarian. If you don't have a master's degree, that's the way to go. Even for people who have a master's degree, we encourage you to, to do the master's degree because it's only three more classes. And it opens the door to working in, say, a public library or an academic library. If you ever wanted to, it gives you that kind of flexibility. So it's kind of, a, I think, a wise decision. Um, also, if you want to get student aid, you do need to sign up as if you're working towards a master's degree, because with financial aid, if you're just doing a certification, then then even you can just do a certification, but you need to say, <laughs> I'm going for the master's degree. Does that make sense? Wink, wink. So <laughs> on your application, you're acting, but when you talk to our advisors, you can say, I, I'm just doing the certification courses, but I have to sign up for the master's degree because, you know, I, I'm trying to get financial aid. They know, they understand, they work with this all the time. Next slide. So in Texas, I already said this, but yes, we are required to have a master's degree plus the school library certification courses. Now, if you're getting the master's degree with us, you're getting the school library. Those nine courses are part of the master's degree. So it's not those nine courses plus a master's degree. Those nine courses are part of the degree. Just want to make sure that that's clear. But if you already have a master's degree in anything, pretty much any field, um, then you can just add the those nine courses and be able to be certified as a school librarian. Next slide. 
these are the courses, the nine courses in the order. I, I teach the first course, School Librarianship. I also teach this last course, the Practicum course. And uh, I teach 5405, the Collection Development course there in the middle as well. The Makerspace course that I mentioned is an elective, so it's not one of the required courses. So it's not on this list. These, these are the required courses. Now, Sarah teaches a a course just on graphic novels, which is really cool too. I think I think she gets a ton of people signed up for that course. That's an elective course as well. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. And then like I mentioned before, if you're not in Texas, every state has different requirements, but I can tell you, I, I think our, our course of study meets the requirements for almost any state. I haven't seen anyone ever have a problem with uh, the program that we have at UNT meeting your state's requirements. It's just their certificate. Some of the states won't require a master's degree to be certified. So it just differs, you know, from state to state, but we will do everything we can to help you and to, you know, navigate that minefield. <laughs> It's because it, it can be a little bit, you know, weird when you start dealing with certification. Go ahead, Sarah. Next. You do need to get B's in all of those nine classes in order for them to count. So B, A's or B's are good. Most of our students get A's. We want you to get A's. That's our goal. My goal is for all of my students to get A's. So I think I'm failing if you're not getting an A. <laughs> so, but you know, sometimes we know how life is. And, and so B's are also fine. Go ahead, Sarah. So to earn the MLS degree, if you if you wanted to get the full master's degree, in, in addition to the nine certification courses, you do need three other courses and they are called the core courses. So next slide, Sarah. Those core courses, by the way, usually students take them towards the beginning. What we would have you do is when you when you um, decided to join us, we would have you make an appointment with our advising office. This is another great thing about UNT. We have a fully staffed advising office that does appointments like all the time and meets with students on Zoom, which is fantastic. I know at Sam Houston, it was just one secretary who was handling all the students. So this is so great because we do have a full-time advising office and they know the answers to all of the questions and they, they can help you and keep you on track and let you know what you need to do. But let's talk about some frequently asked questions. Other than coursework, what is required? So you gotta take these 12 classes to be in, in, in the master's degree, nine classes for certification and what else? Go ahead, Sarah. There's an electronic portfolio. So um, this is a capstone project. If you're doing the master's program, you will do this as your capstone project and you will start it your very first semester. So in that 5001 class, which is the very first class you take, it's called school librarianship. You will start working on an electronic portfolio. So you'll, you'll learn a lot more about it. Then we have a meeting, you have an assignment to do. Also in your core classes, two of them, you have assignments to do in your electronic portfolio. Otherwise, you should be adding to it every semester. And a lot more information would be coming, you know, later about that. But just so you know, it's an electronic portfolio. I love it. I think the end products are amazing. It's a great way for you to document your learning and the way you're changing and what you're, what, how you're growing as a professional over time. And it's pretty amazing when you can go back and see where you started and then where, where you are at the end. And also it gives you a place to store all of that information so you don't lose it. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever had that problem, but you you know your computer crashes and you lose everything. Well, if it's in your electronic portfolio, hello, you will always have it because you also get to take it with you after, after you leave UNT. So that's really cool. Next slide. 
you do have to do a practicum as well. And this is required by the state of Texas. We require this for all of our students, even if you're outside of the state of Texas, because it's just so important. It's a 160 clock hour practicum. There's a lot we can teach you in classes, but there's no better way to learn than actually being in there to be in the library and get to experience some of the things that you need to know. It really is the best way to learn. The great news is you're not expected to do this 160 hours all in one semester. We start with you the very first class you take. We start with you getting a mentor and start accumulating hours. Usually if you were to if it were to take you about 18 months to two years to get your degree, you would want to clock about two hours a week in the library. So some people, what works best is to work with the librarian on your campus so that you can just go into the library whenever you have time. I mean, people go sometimes during planning periods, before school, after school, when they're doing a book fair, I mean, whatever the case may be. So, so you know, we always encourage people to make it as easy for yourself as you can to actually get into the library. And we talk about the practicum experience a lot in the first class and get you set up and on your way um, to getting that practicum. Next slide. If you live in Texas, you will also take the certification exam before you graduate because it's required. Darn it. <laughs> the good news is, you know, we don't, none of us, does anyone like certification exams? I mean, they're pretty miserable. So, but it's a requirement. The good news is we work with you. So I have been in programs and I won't name any names. Sam Houston. <laughs> where you could graduate but but then you had to get certified and if you couldn't pass the test oh well too bad because you graduated <laughs> you know not our problem well I mean that's putting it in a tacky way it wasn't quite that bad but here at UNT we we want you to finish that we realize that really the degree does you no good if you don't get certified so we are going to hold your hand and make sure you pass that certification test we do that in your very last class in your practicum course Be, we wait till then because we want you to have all of the coursework under your belt you're much more likely to be prepared for the certification test at the end of your program so we work with you we have a study module we have practice test um we we just really dissect this test and think about what are they really trying to say <laughs> and and i think it's really helpful so so that's something that i really like next slide so why choose UNT? One thing that's great about UNT is it is an ALA accredited program and that gives you options. So if you if you do the master's in library science, you can be a school librarian, but you can also work in a public library. It, it's um, if it, a program is not ALA accredited, then you could only do school library. So so this accreditation is really important. Also, it means that we are being looked at very closely to make sure that we're teaching what you need to know in order to be successful as a school librarian. And we just were renewed right before the pandemic started. We were like literally going through our meetings right as it was starting. So, so we just, we were just renewed a couple years ago with that accreditation. Next slide. Also, I mentioned our practicum. I have worked in programs where the practicum happened all in one semester, which, how would you do that? You'd have to quit your job, probably. I mean, I don't know how else someone could do 160 hours in one semester, which is a common way that this is done. I, I've, I've been in programs where the practicum is done in one semester and it was really hard for, because most people, sadly can't quit their job to do a practicum. So this is something that I think that I think is a, a really good benefit of coming to UNT because it's spread out, <laughs> spread out over time. Next slide. And of course, I mentioned the Texas certification test that we will work with you. And look at this beautiful white squirrel. Have you seen him, Sarah? 
<laughs> no, I haven't seen him in person. <laughs> I haven't either, but I want to find him. Isn't he pretty? He's he's really out there. <laughs> it's just beautiful. But yeah, the Texas certification test, we are committed to helping you pass that test. Um, you know what? A lot of you won't have any trouble with it at all. Some people have test anxiety, though, and you never know what will happen. Whatever your problem is, <laughs> we're going to help you. We want you to pass that test. So, so that's important. And I have not ever worked with anyone who couldn't pass it. So I, I just, I feel like, you know, that's just going to happen. Next slide. Are all of our classes offered online? This is a question we get quite a bit. Go ahead, Sarah. Yes, all of our classes are offered online. And go ahead, Sarah. What I really like too is that every class is offered every semester. This is so convenient <laughs> because I, I have worked in programs too where it's like, oh, okay, you got to take this class in the spring because it won't be offered again until next spring. And so if you miss it this spring, then oh no, you got to wait a whole nother year to get. I, it can just wreak havoc with people trying to figure out oh, what do I have to get now. So that doesn't happen here because we offer every single class every semester. So if something happens and you need to take the summer off, you were planning to go to, to school in the summer, but you can't, that's okay because we still offer every class in the fall as well. So that makes it really convenient. We also offer classes um, usually in the short semester. So We'll have a couple in the winter semester, and then there's a short, like, three-week semester also in May. And so sometimes you can pick up a class really fast there, too. Next slide. And there's two easy steps to apply. By the way, this PowerPoint, if you want a copy, you can email me and I'll give you my email address here in a minute. I'll put it in the chat. You Because these, these links are hyperlinked, so it'll take you right to the graduate school application. You have to apply to the graduate school since it's a graduate program. And no, the GRE is not required in case anyone's wondering, not required. But that's the first step. Second, go ahead. Sarah. You apply to the Department of Information Science. So there are two applications, one to the graduate school, one to the Department of Information Science. Both are simple. Um, applications. They're not horrifying. And, and and one of them is like the I Apply Texas, I think is the one through the graduate school, which you might be familiar with. So there, it's not a difficult process to apply. Okay, next slide. Now, when you are choosing, you there will be different options. So if you don't want to do the master's degree and you're like paying out of pocket, you're not doing financial aid, you can just choose school library certification. But if you need financial aid, then even if you are just doing school library certification, you need to say that you're doing the master, the MS and school library certification. Now, like I already said, those nine classes are counted in the master's degree, but that's how it's stated on the application. MS and school library certification. Okay, next slide. And if you have more questions, our website is just full of answers. Also, you can email me. Here's my email address, and I'm going to put it in the chat too. I answer questions all the time about our program and you know what we offer and you know sometimes you have specific questions related to whatever is going on with you and I'm happy to answer any of those questions anytime and go ahead Sarah I know we have one more slide. oh yes this is our next month's webinar is going to be fabulous we have one of our former students actually Matthew Zuniga is um running a library in an alternative school, a high school level alternative school. And, and he and the students actually set up the library themselves. He he had, um, he was teaching in the alternative school, he still is. And there was like a space for a library, but nothing there. So he went and got a master's degree in library science just so that he would know what to do to set up this space. So he's kind of the librarian, but he's still teaching too. So he's doing a little bit of 
of everything. But he had the students help him set up the library so that they could make it what they wanted it to be. A really fabulous story. So that's next month on uh, Wednesday, April 13th. So, all right. So now we just want to answer any questions that you might have. And I addressed one question. Jennifer had a, a question about um, the classes. Are they on Zoom? Are they um, at a certain time? So the classes are asynchronous. Now there are deadlines, usually weekly deadlines within the class, but generally you're working through the material um, through Canvas Learning Management System. I know some of you have those in your school, so you know what that is. Um, but then some classes will have, I know for cataloging, um, Dr. Schultz-Jones will do a, a weekly required lecture because um, it's easier for people to ask questions in time when you're doing cataloging. Um, and so, but I know she always records it just in case you can't make it. Hi, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, what is the typical pace that someone pursuing a master's degree in this um, would go through the course? Like for me, I've been out of school for 10 years. I have a full-time job. What's the, how many classes do people take at a time? What's the typical pace? So most people take two at a time. And I think that's because financial aid requires a certain number of credits. Sarah, is that right? Is it five credits that are required, which doesn't, it's kind of weird because two classes is six credits, but but I, I think if you're getting financial Most people aid, seem to take two. Yeah, um, two classes. But um, I mean, if people are not working, I've, I've seen them take three, although we, we usually say maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> two is probably better, but I've also seen people take one class um, a semester, and sometimes for teachers, it's easier in the summer to take more mm -hmm. because you're, you know, you're not working in the summer, so, so you can devote more time, and our advisors will work with you, too. I mean, if you feel like, okay, I can really handle three this summer, then they'll clear you to sign up for, for a third class, and then, of course, we also have those little winter semester and the little one after the spring semester before summer that can be a nice way to work in a quick little class too okay but it doesn't uh, have to be any certain pace I mean oh, okay yeah it's well you have to finish in five years <laughs> from okay the time that's what <laughs> yeah five years that's good to know <laughs> so I can't stretch this out perfect yes yes you can <laughs> Um, Trisha, I, I've been answering some questions in the chat, but there is one I do not know. So Marisa Tobias asks about, do you see that? Yes. If you get hired as a school librarian before doing the program, could the hours you're working? But yes. For practicum, yes, they can. And so, Marissa, you would still want to have um, a mentor. You'd still be required to have a mentor. The mentor does not have to be with you, though. It's like the mentor doesn't have to be watching you, <laughs> everything you do, because we understand that you might be working in a library. Absolutely. And, and so you can just have conversations with your mentor. And that's a lot of people do it that way. Sometimes you might be in the same room with your mentor, but you can just just say, okay, well, I need to do A, B, and C, and your mentor will be like, okay, that sounds good, and if you have questions, you know, I'm here to help. I mean, so that mentor relationship, it really is that they are, they are there as your kind of go-to person, but yes, if you're working in the library, your practicum hours will add up fast <laughs> because, you know, you're there 40 hours a week, so. If you're working in a public library, so Aliana, are you asking about for school librarianship or for the public library program? <laughs> um, because for um, for the public library part, um, yes, if you are working um, in a public library, um, 
and you want to become a school a school librarian, you have to do the hours in a school library, I think, Tricia, don't you? Because of the state of Texas? Yes. Now, we do allow like 30 hours in the public library. So, so yes, but the state of Texas does want most of those hours to be in the school library if you're doing the school library practicum. But we, and for the we, public library one, if you're worked at least six um, if you're working at least half time, so that's 20 hours a week for at least six months in a public library, and you are doing new services activities, um, you're not only shelving or, you know, you're actually involved in doing some programming and some reference services, then you can um, do a waiver where school librarians don't have, don't get a waiver. Also the public library part, it's like 120, I think, instead of 160, right? I think that's right. Yes, under 20. And I also um, supervise that class, not supervise, I teach the class, I guess you'd say, um, for the general practicum class for public librarians. Yeah, the acceptance, it, they work through it, you know, as quickly as they can. I mean, their goal is to get you in. Um, they also, though, they work with our whole information science department. So other than what Sarah and I do, we have the school library program and then the, the youth and library services. We have other programs as well in our in our department. So, so um, you know, it's it's a consistent <laughs> thing. I saw someone wanted to know how many students. I'm not sure how many students we have currently. We tend to have somewhere between about 25 and 50 students start each semester. So usually the fall semester is a little bit bigger. And in the summer, we tend to have about 25 to 30 students start the program. And a lot of times you will get to know uh, your classmates because you may be moving through the program at about the same time. It's not a cohort group, but it kind of feels like it. So you'll end up seeing the same people, you know, and, and working with some of the same people in classes, which is great. And it, aren't the classes generally isn't it capped at 35? It is, yes. So so usually if like if we have 50 students starting, usually we'll break that into two sections. So but that usually only happens in the fall semester. What are the work yeah. for a mentor? And Marissa, are you wondering about the mentor for the school library program? Yeah, she is. Okay. So um let me think, the mentor has to have, I believe it's three years of experience as a school librarian and be certified in the state of Texas. Now, if you're if you're joining us from outside the state, we can waive a lot of those requirements because, because you know, you will have very different, uh, a very different possible certification route. But if you're in the state of Texas, the state of Texas actually sets those requirements for us. So they would need three years of experience as a school librarian, and then um, they need to be certified as a school librarian. From their own journal. I'm reading what Mason's saying here. Could you put those? Yeah, I got an email from message from Mason too. Um, but first, um, can you get Christy Garza had a question about the school library? Yes, is the school library certification an, an approved education preparation program to also become a certified teacher? No. So if you want to be a certified teacher, it's a different program. Um, so you are required in the state of Texas, one of the requirements to become a school librarian is that you have to have two years of teaching experience. Now, this is for Texas here again. So if you're outside of the state of Texas, your state may have different requirements. But in the state of Texas, you need to have two years of teaching experience in an accredited school. So usually, 
that's a public school, although private schools can be accredited as well. So two years of teaching experience, you have to have a master's degree, any master's degree, you have to complete a library certification program, a school library certification program. So that's those nine, those nine classes and you have to pass the school library certification exam. So there's four main requirements to be a school librarian, but a teacher prep program that would that they that would be handled in the College of Education at UNT. So, um, I mean, unless you already have a bachelor's degree and you wanted to go, you know, alternative education route, there's programs like I Teach Texas, you know, where you can where you can um, get certified while you're actually teaching. Does that help, Christy? Yeah, so I have two years, but in private school and I'm not uh, certified. So I'm guessing I would, could only be a school librarian in a private school until I get certified. Is that? Yes. So, okay. So um, now you're, the school that you work in, do you know if it's an accredited school? Yes, it is. Okay. But you're not, you're not certified as a teacher, but you are working in an accredited school. Yeah. I have my, my Texas content. Okay. Can you, because here's the thing, you don't have to be a certified teacher to be a librarian, but you do have to have two years teaching experience. Email me, Christy, and I'm going to check with someone, our certification officer here at UNT, and just make sure what she says, because I've not actually ever heard that before, because technically it's not to be a, to be certified. Right now, I'm certified as a school librarian, and I'm not certified as, as a public school teacher. You don't have to, and I can go work at any library, you know, school library here in Texas. So you don't have to have that certification, um, the teacher certification to be a librarian, although you do have to have the two years experience. So you, I think you would be fine, but let's run it by Ann Miller. So if you'll email me, I'll pass that along to her and we'll just let her weigh in to make sure. <laughs> How does that sound? Thank you. And it sounds like maybe Blair Kelly's question would be something too that could, um, uh, be um, addressed as well. Okay, um, so Blair. Maybe I individually. Think, yeah, that's, that's, I, I, and, and that would be, um, I believe that if you work more than 50% of the time in a school year, the district will count that as one year of experience. I mean, I believe that's the law in Texas. I was just dealing with another student today about that same question. That will be another question too for our certification officer and possibly for your HR department and the district where you work. So, so if you can email me, Blair, then we'll go from there because because um, it depends on what your district puts on your teacher service record. So what we want to see is that teacher service record. And here's the other thing, everyone. You can be, I have students in the program who don't have the two years teaching experience, but they're getting it while they're completing the master's program. So that's also, you know, an option. I mean, if you have like a year and a half of experience when you start, but you'll have two years, you can even finish the master's degree and not have the two years experience. You can't be a certified librarian until you do have the two years of experience teaching, but you can get the master's degree. We won't stop you from entering the program, but we will make sure that you know you can't get certified now <laughs> until you get that two years experience. You understand that. I mean, we actually make people sign a document to that effect, in fact, to make sure that you understand. But I think, um, Blair, where are you, Blair? Blair, can you, can you email me too? And let's, let's run your question by our certification officer. And, and also, Blair, if you can get me your teacher service records through your HR department, and email it to me that can that tells me a lot too um and let me answer some I was typing and like it's faster to just explain so <laughs> um let's see so if you want to start the summer enrollment deadline is April 15th is a priority deadline um and I think you can apply after but that's you don't it, you're kind of like not considered they'd probably ask you to wait till the fall um it would I enroll and so yes, CYAL 
is the concentration that's meant to train you to work in a public library with kiddos. Um, now, and then that's, sorry, um, the, the, there's not like a, a strict certification um, process to be a public librarian working with kids. Um, and so um, the minimum to be a librarian is that you have to have the master's, but the, um, the certification is to set you up for success or the, the concentration is set you up for success. Um, we have a lot of school, um, master's librarian students who will use their electives and pull from the um, certification list for the um, <clears throat> for the, the graduate academic certificate so that you have a graduate academic certificate and you have you know so then it just helps you when you go on the job market right you can point and say yeah I'm flexible I can work in both these settings um, uh, let's see do, 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 do. for practical if really acting as volunteer uh, would that count for practicum? Um, did you employed? <laughs> you don't actually have to be employed um, for the practicum, um, but you have to be like doing tasks, like helping to do programs, running a program, running a story time, um, so that you get experience doing stuff um, that you would be expected to do. Um, and libraries are really used to that they're used to the practicum situation. Um, uh, did I catch, I'm missing. Uh, Desiree asked what no, two okay. places you need to apply. So, so you apply to the graduate school and you apply to the information science department, which is within the College of Information. And um, if you, if you'd like, to, you know what, let me see if I can, uh, while Sarah's talking, I'll see if I can go and find that, uh, those links and just, put them in here if you see any other um yes um if you guys want to know more about the financial side i know that um you know unt has like a website set up just for financial aid um and then um and they even have like a tuition calculator. Um, you can always start with our advising office. They do get a lot of emails, but they're really nice about trying to make sure they direct you to the right place. Um, and they have that general um, email address that um, I put up earlier in the chat. Um, you know, and and let's see. It is eight o'clock, so everyone is free to go if they wish, and, and this will be recorded, or it is recorded, it will be posted. Um, and then also, um, I think it's important to know that um, in the University of North Texas, you know, we're a, a place of higher education, and especially in our master's program, we're expecting that we are training you to go out and work with a diverse set of um, community members. So we ask you to be open minded and we ask people to um, have honest discussions, but also, um, you know, understand that um, there we are as librarians, our goal is to defend one of our major goals is defending the First Amendment and people's access to information. Um, and so, you know, there are some intense conversations about stuff like that. Um, but uh, we, so far, all the school and library folk, because those are the faculty I work closest with, have a have a very, and I think most of our faculty have a good sense of, um, of that. But, you know, we will ask you to maybe push outside your boundaries when you're thinking and try to have empathy for, frankly, the families for all the different kinds of families you're going to work with. Um, so you're representing a whole community. So I think somebody brought that up. Um, other questions? Yeah, Aliana. Or, Hi, sorry if it's your way. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so does this program apply to become a librarian in the higher academic settings? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to apply just right now because I actually just graduated with my bachelor's August of last year. 
and I'm taking a little bit of a break right now. So I'm just trying to figure out what I want to do and where I'm going. And of course, those important questions that every college student that graduates asks themselves. So I'm just trying to like weigh my options and see what I like. And um, I've always loved the higher academic settings, you know, and to be quite frank, I do miss it a lot. You know, I miss going to school and I do love, you know, books and, and stuff like that. And would this program kind of like be the same, um, like to be a librarian, like at a community college or a university? Yes, so um, the general requirement for any library institution um, is the Masters of um, Library and Information Science. Um, now, sometimes um, in higher education, it's helpful um, if people have another master's. If you're trying to work in a specialized field, like, um, you know, if you want to be the Eastern, um, Far Eastern languages librarian, then you know you're going to have to have a background and some of that. How uh, some higher ed people, um, librarians do have double masters, but not all of them do. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that's we have. Um, you know, a course aimed towards academic librarianship, and um, yeah, it's definitely something that I've had students in my graphic novels course, and we talk about building graphic novel collections and archives, stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? Looks like, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. Eliana, is your oh. hand up? She was the one who just asked about the Okay, so maybe she's good. <laughs> Her hand's just up. That's okay. Yeah. Um, definitely feel free to reach out to more, to us for more questions. Um, we are both very open to that. And then, yeah, definitely um, come to one of our webinars, check out our website, see what's coming up. We've got some great um, speakers coming. And so, yeah, thanks everyone. And they're recorded too. So if you wanted to go back and watch any of those from the past. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, nice to see everyone tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mason. Thank 